George creates a magic in a still photograph. I've probably done a photo session with maybe a thousand different photographers. They take hundreds and hundreds of pictures. George takes three frames, and every one is good. Turn your head just a little bit, Sharon. There. That's good. That's good. That's good. Yeah. George has photographed every movie star there ever was. In the world of a real photograph, people are sculpted to beautiful, creamy perfection. They're like gods or demigods. You could almost touch the texture of the image. You could feel the softness of skin. You're very much a voyeur, because it's not just a photograph of a person, it's a mood. You just wish that somehow you could be there with that person whispering because there are photographs that call for a little soft, sensual whisper. In those early days, it was going to last forever. We were all going to be such big shots forever and ever. All over the world, our names were being thrown around, and we could relax and enjoy it. Hell's Angels, the opening of this picture at Raman's Chinese Theater in Hollywood was the biggest premiere ever seen anywhere in the world before or since. Jean Harlow. Thank you. I would like to use this occasion to publicly thank Mr. Hughes for the opportunity he gave me. Dear old Jean, all she did was just have fun all the time, no matter what she was doing. She had a unique beauty that no one else could even mimic. It was a style of her own. And good old Gary Cooper. If we only had a couple of dozen Gary Coopers around today. And dear old Crawford. She loved to pose for stills. She could find a pose every two seconds. Never stopped. In fact, it was kind of difficult to just keep up with her. Well, I went for a sitting. I'd never met George Hurrell at that point, but I was so impressed with him as he worked. He uh, was slight, he moved very fast, very good looking, and the atmosphere in his studio was absolutely great. Music playing, and the way he moved uh, absolutely fascinated me. I mean, you couldn't help but do your best to pose for him. He, he really was a very good looking fellow. He was slender and dark and sexy. <laughs> I think most of the girls felt that way about him, too. It didn't make you feel conscious about posing at all. He'd change a light from time to time. I, I wish he'd been here to light me for this. <laughs> I loved the pictures he did of me. He was a delight. Charlie came by just to see what I was doing in there for such a long time. <laughs> and uh, George Urell said, hey, let's get one of you two together. He was the top agent in this town, and everybody loved Charlie Feldman.
Those were the days where everybody seemed to know each other and uh, go to each other's parties. We would all have a very good time Saturday night, have a few drinks. Next day, have a little hangover, go right up to David Selznick's, start all over again. I thought it was great. <laughs> great fun. The social life in Hollywood was wonderful. All the stars in Hollywood came to dinner parties. I think it was a romantic era. Beautiful, beautiful. Congratulations, Betty. Same to you, Spence. It was just the most marvelous time. You think too much about it, <laughs> you, you lose it. And it was all a magnificent facade. Yes. <laughs> That's Hollywood. I intended in the first place to become a fine painter, not a photographer. I became a photographer because I had to make a living. I couldn't sell my art just like that, boom, but I could sell my photography. As Soon as I shot it, I could sell it. I arrived in Laguna around the middle of May 1925, and on June 1st, I celebrated my 21st birthday. Laguna Beach in 1925 was a very well-known art colony, and there were many, many artists there. It was such a beautiful place, and it was so varied. There were gorgeous beaches and the canyons and rocks that jutted out into the sea. It had all those gorgeous uh, uh, eucalyptus trees, probably the biggest that were ever grown outside of Australia, and they just towered up to the skies. There was a village where people gathered uh, to get away from it all. They didn't have a photographer until I arrived, and then I was uh, shooting everything. All of these artists were of such note that they uh, needed photography of their work and photography of themselves and were always being written up by local papers or magazines. And they were quite pleased that they had this uh, young, wild photographer. So <laughs> out of it all came this hearty young man with too much energy ready for anything. Pancho Barnes, the flyer, used to come down all the time. And she was the one who introduced me to Ramon Navarro because I had shot so many pictures of her, which she liked so much. He was uh, having quite a rip-snorting time with uh, Pancho. He decided that uh, I should shoot some pictures that he wanted for his operatic endeavors. He was going to Europe and become a, an opera star, and MGM was against it and didn't want any part of it. Nevertheless, he went to work, and the result was uh, Ramon with his horse and sword and playing the role of Parsifal. Well, this was my first studio when I came up from Laguna Beach, 6702 Lafayette Park Place. The very first studio and where I shot Norma Shearer. Norma Shearer was one of the biggest stars at MGM. 
She wanted to do a film a little on the, on the wicked side, you might say. And I think it was with Clark Gable, as I recall. Her husband, Irving Thalberg, who was the head of production at MGM, didn't think that her particular talents would serve the purpose of this script that she wanted to do. But she saw herself in a different way. When she came down to my studio, why she explained what she wanted, and I deliberately made her look like the hussy that she wanted to be. We let her legs show a little bit, drop the, the shoulder a little bit, uh, and uh, let the hair fall over her eye a bit. God, we were being so sexy in those days. And today, why, well, you'd laugh at it. You'd think, sex? That's no sex. That's just plain old-fashioned. <laughs> Having seen the photographs, Thalberg uh, decided that she had the talent, and she got the role. She came to me with all her hairdressers and makeup people and wardrobe people and publicity people, and they all trailed in, went up the staircase, and that's where she changed clothes and everything, and came down the stairs and then went up again for the changes. And back in here was my dark room. In fact, the shelf is still here. I used to put the film in the tray, develop everything by hand, and then the washing was done right here in this sink. And right here was the shooting area. Right in this area here. And shoot from here. Usually it was pretty close. Sometimes I used that staircase, too. It was a good background. I think I'll move in here again. It's pretty darn comfortable. Norma Scheer decided, well, we ought to have him come over to the studio and do all our portraits. Well, they called me and wanted to know if I would take over their gallery. And I played a little hard to get for about uh, two or three minutes. And then after that, why, well, of course, <laughs> I got to thinking, photographing all those big stars was uh, an accomplishment for just a young punk like myself. And uh, why shouldn't I do it? It was MGM, the biggest studio in the industry. So I took it. One thing that Harrell was part of was a package, a uh, Hollywood package. And I think in those days that um, the studio photographers worked with the studio closely to come up with something, something original, something fresh, and something that would make news to the public. They're calling all stars at MGM's Hollywood Studios to gather on stage number 27 for the most costly single photograph ever taken, a group picture for a Look Magazine feature on A Day with the Stars. Here's lovely Esther Williams. In the days of the big studio system, the public images of stars were very carefully guided and controlled by people who knew how to create icons. ...his place right next to Elizabeth Taylor. They dressed you, they groomed you, they had you walk a certain way and be seen with certain people. It's completely different now. I'm sorry that those that are there now don't know how much fun it can be and could be and was at the time I was there because you had the protection of the studios who acted like a big father figure in your life to protect you from all of the... Um, little decisions that you could make. They told you what film you were going to make, what uh, clothes to wear, how to wear your hair, what makeup was best suited for you. It was like going through a, a wonderful school to learn how to behave as a star because, of course, everybody under contract believed that they were going to be made an MGM star.
And how do you live? And what kind of a person are you? I'm a prodigal son, the black sheep of a white flock. I shall die on the gallows. Harrell was working with the studios closely. They were coming up with something that people would talk about, that people would remember. Having a picture taken was a necessary part of being a motion picture actor. A lot of these celebrities were made by those pictures as opposed to the films. Sometimes you don't remember the films, but you remember the image of this person just because of the strength of the character and the glamour that was in these photographs. Stills really mattered, and covers of magazines were very important. The portraits of the Hollywood stars was very important at that time. The publicity pictures that went out, the pictures that were in the magazine, that's what helped make them stars. I mean, being up there in, the, in a movie was one thing, but I think that having photographs was a, was a very part of that whole, that whole thing. Very important part of it. I remember just thinking, these photographs are from heaven. They're not earthbound. They're not of this planet. They're from a different world where everything is um, bigger and better than life. And I think it was actually some of those early photographic images that made me want to be in film because it was that special kind of what we call Hollywood glamour that was a dream and something to aspire to. He was able to focus on glamour and almost create a dreamlike quality about it, all the while he was creating a much more artistic view of the people that he photographed. George has captured that the incredible health and fitness and beauty and kind of that sat satin quality in the skin with that worn and sad quality that Johnny Weissmuller had that creates this moment in the picture that's extraordinary. I think that he was able to focus on human nature more so than just the 30s or the 40s or whatever year. I think that it was deeper than that. I think it was more about human emotion and dreams. They're very intriguing to me. They capture a completely different feeling, um, a sophistication and an elegance and, again, a mystery that Hollywood lacks um, now in the 90s. Great. Yeah. Super. Uh -huh. You know, you tend to look upon the photographer as the man who's going to bring this very special, womanly, oh, feminine, oh, glamorous image yeah. out of you. And right, right in the lens, I think you're better with it. Yeah, there. Okay. George, it gives you the sense of approval right away and that you're going to have a good time and, and it's not that serious. That's good. Now. I'm going to get you like that, happy like that. <laughs> George is very precise. He sees something while you're getting into position. And then from that point on, everything is designed to just make that particular image absolutely as perfect as he can make it. I think he has a very special view of what's beautiful and what's glamorous and what is seductive. And as soon as he sees it, that's it. Now I gotta have another happy one. So there, there. Only you're gonna be laughing. 
<laughs> How are you going to make somebody laugh? Now, do I tell you, laugh, please? Is that going to get a laugh? But if I suddenly go, <laughs> well, it's a funny thing. You may laugh yourself, thinking, well, how the hell are you going to get a laugh out of that? Well, I get laughs. I get laughs out of that. And I yell and I holler and I make the craziest faces and I sometimes jump and holler and uh, carry on. Oh, and he's a great guy. He's a great guy. You gotta like him, though. There, that's good. Good, 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 good. Shooter in Griffith Park. A rock's a rock, a tree's a tree. I don't know what I'm gonna do before I start. That's what old Emily used to say. 2.8. I don't know. I don't analyze that kind of thing. I just uh, do it by uh, instinct. I'm always expecting them to project something. Now, this time, turn your head just a little bit more, a little bit more, and look over there. That hand can just, yeah, disappear. That's good. Terrific. Too good. We can't make these too good, you know. So let me see. Maybe the uh, word I'm legend gonna... is overused and abused. It's a word that I don't overuse and abuse. And George Terrell is a living legend. Good. Good. We did it. We did it with happiness. He told me they used to uh, put jazz records on and that became kind of the rhythm and motion of the moment to kind of create a kind of syncopation with the photograph and making of the photographs. I think it put the uh, personalities at ease and, and, and gave them kind of an easy, easy access. You strike a pose and then you light it. Then you had to clown around and get some action going in the expressions. And finally, shoot some exposures. George really knew what he was doing because he knew how to paint with light. And he made it fun. He would jump over here, over there. He loved to get you off guard. He used to have very, very soft music. It was just enough to take the loudness out of the stillness. He was so sensitive. There's always a sexuality in the pictures, and a wonderful allure and mystery. He's the kind of man that got along with women very well. Obviously, the ladies liked him, and he liked them. My hunch is that as, as much as he, you know, gave the best of himself to both men and women, my hunch is that he really loved photographing women. He was making love to them with a camera. George Harrell made a, a photograph of Jane Russell for Howard Hughes for the film The Outlaw. No, no, you better not get up till tomorrow. You said that yesterday. But you're not strong enough yet. Who says I'm not? Billy, you must until you'll hurt yourself. Then why don't you quit wrestling with me? Of course, it was a cowboy picture, and he wanted to photograph Jane in a big pile of hay, and they certainly made a beautiful photograph of Jane Russell looking very sexy.
that went on to uh, make the outlaw a very successful picture. Well, when you look at her in the haystack, pretty great. Of course, she had to have a pistol in her hand because maybe you're going to get away. <laughs> She's not going to let you. <laughs> I believe that he truly loved women. He loved men. He loved his subjects. He loved what he was doing. And I think that, that with that comes a sense of respect and sexuality and sensuality and beauty and glamour all fused together. photographs show the manliness of the men and also a sensitivity in his men. He invented that kind of iconography for film actors, his notion of the leading man, a particular kind of masculinity, and, and his leading women. Uh, there is such strength in their femininity. It, it's, um, it's very powerful. It's also very beautiful. Tilt that light in the back. Tilt it down more. Ideally, I would like people to see me as glamorous and mysterious. I love when people say I look like a period actress. The hair, the clothes are ultimately feminine and, and silks and, you know, beautiful prints. I like that. <laughs> See, this light's so high on your face that your head's gonna be up. And also, that gives it energy. The whole thing is so simple. You just have to be able to see what you do in front of the camera with the light, with the subject, and know what's going to happen to it on the film. Just look up in the air here, right, right over my head. It's amazing to me that he knows exactly what he wants, takes six photographs, and comes up with incredibly beautiful work. Okay, here goes the masterpiece of the age. That's good, that's good, that's good. Harrell was really about lighting. Lighting created mood, and he knew how to capture the mood of, of a celebrity. He gave Anne Sheridan the oomph that they ultimately titled uh, The Oomph Girl. Rita Hayworth, that sexuality that, that just emerged, came out of those wonderful photographs that, that Harrell did. Garbo, I mean, God, the light and shade in Garbo's portraits, they're just extraordinary, and it's because he understood lighting so deeply. Gloria Swanson had this wonderful line, uh, we had faces then. The way he lit their faces, you know, their cheekbones, lips, so seductive. You were seduced by light and shade, as composed by George Harrell. I just think there was always a great deal of visual richness and certain of his photographic tricks always appealed to me. Um, who else gives you eyelash shadows that go halfway down a cheek? Or these impossible contorted poses uh, with the head thrown back and the hair cascading. These are trademark Harrell things. 
And he worked with people that were absolutely beautiful to begin with, but he said, no, I'm gonna change this and change this. And he made them into gods and goddesses. He made them perfect, unattainable. They become fantasies. I could see that there's, there's complete trust in the photographer when you look at the pictures. You know that Gene Harlow or Gary Cooper or whoever they were, Joan Crawford, that they, they, felt, they felt good. They felt we're in good hands. Let that foot come down so it just goes away. Yes, good. That's better that way. And that's good that way. He seems a lot more spry than I thought he would be, and he's really still full of energy and full of life. Okay, we're almost ready now. There, just off center like that. I want to change that key light and put it on this side then. He is in good shape for 87. It's good, just, just what you're doing. Well, this has an elegance, the whole thing. The jewelry, the hair. It's good, it's good with that little smile. There's nothing that's practicing about okay. George Harrell. He knows exactly what he's doing. Drop your chin just, to, just there. I can trust a photographer like George Harrell. I know that I'm in good hands with him. I'm gonna just go over here. Great, hold everything. Another masterpiece. George was a painter, uh, and so he really pays attention to light and shadows. And the fantastic thing about his photography is that he really does, to use the phrase, he paints with light. Uh, and there's tremendous depth to his images. He's using tungsten lighting. Uh, he's got a very beautiful sense of where to place the shadows, because I think that's really the trick in a Harrell photograph, is not where is the light, but where are the shadows. And he's such a master of, of light and shadow and composition. The average person doesn't know tungsten from strobe. Strobe is a very treacherous light. It can be very, very uh, strong, and it can, it can be piercing, and it can be cruel. While I think that tungsten light can be soft and more flattering, more youthful. I like about George is that he would get so close to a lot of his subjects, you could see the pores in their skin, you know? I mean, I never knew Joan Crawford had freckles. His photographs very often give the impression that they are glimpses within um, a person's whole being. Very often you don't look at his photographs and understand it immediately. There's questions that you ask about it. The glancing off or the, the sadness in the eyes. He brings in another reality to it that causes people to pay attention. Pretty good what they were doing. Yeah, I think. Are you comfortable? Oh, yes. Expressions of everything with a portrait. It's pretty good. And you can, you can let your head flop like that. Yeah, yeah, it's good. With portraits, you can't just put your subject down there, get them into a nice pose, and then forget about their uh, personalities. You've got to uh, be sure that 
their personalities are expressed in some way because that's part of what the portrait is about. Now, Sharon Stone, I think she has a beautiful Too good face. For him. Too good for and him. when it's laughing, it's so full of vivacity and so spontaneous. <laughs> now, this time, just serious and broody and dreamy. No, no smile. And yet she can be moody and actually have a kind of sexy quality when, with just uh, dreamy eyes. That's good. It did it again. How do you do it so quick? Boy, just a master. Hey, do that. We'll change that hand a little bit. George feels the light. That's good. It's almost like he looks at the air between he and you. And you can just feel it when he, he moves the lights. You just sense that the light is inviting you into the photograph. It's an amazing experience. It's just magic. Here we go, coming into Altoona. All aboard! But you have it. Turn it on. There is no other photographer like George. There are great photographers, and then there's George. Hi, George. How are you? Oh, I'm pretty good. Picking up? Pretty good for an old character. I have always, from the very beginning, indulged in doing everything that is connected with my work. Yeah, that's it. Uh, I think every photographer forms habits within himself, as a painter does. He likes certain ways that uh, the brushes work. And it gets that way with a photographer, too. That's my favorite. That's such a beautiful photo. I wish I could do something like that someday. You don't use any strobes. It's all spotlights. No. Uh, and what kind of lights? Strictly are, spotlights. What kind of lights are they? Are they well, I rent the spotlights from uh, Mo Richardson. Uh-huh. And uh, just plug them in and mm. go to work. Mm. I'll have to borrow your pen. Thank you for showing those to me. That really meant a well, lot. I have to do it. Really, it means a lot to me. Never too old to hear flattering remarks <laughs> about my work. Well, I'm so actually, grateful for having the talent to do it. Okay, right. well, thanks a lot. Right. We'll see you. And you can't get egotistical about it because you had nothing to do with it. You're just lucky enough to be born with it, that's all. In the old days, I had such physical energy that, God, I never stopped. If it wasn't uh, shooting or uh, carrying on with work or down in the dark room, why, it was uh, out scouring the town, uh, uh, boozing it up, uh, having a, a big time with my social crowd. <laughs> I never went to school to study photography. I never studied composition. I just know composition. I know balance. I just don't have any way of explaining because when you're born with it, you're born with it. That's all. You're just lucky enough to have your legs and your arms and, and your eyeballs. <laughs> it's the same damn thing. No, I use one of those most of the time. Photography has all those mechanical aspects, but to me, you make that complicated or you make it simple. I make it so simple that uh, nobody believes me when I tell them.
They are just uh, things that have to be done. It's just like the camera has to be carried. You know, you put well, it over your shoulder and carry things, it. What but, the hell? Uh, I still think that this is one of the best, for my purposes, anyway. Right, right. Well, anyway, thanks a lot. Yeah, You've been welcome. very kind to let me see all this stuff. No problem. We'll thanks. be seeing you. Have a good day. Thanks a lot. I don't know what his secret was. I've asked him about various uh, photographs, and he says he uses one light. Now, that's awful hard to swallow, but I, when I really start looking at this photograph, it's true. But I think George's uh, secret is that he follows through. He does his own retouching. Nobody sees anything until George is ready to show it. By that time, it's absolutely gorgeous. Here we have the great Garbo. She was a great personality. Being the grim, silent Garbo was her decision. She probably was laughing like hell five minutes after that shot was made. <laughs> the dashing Errol Flynn, chasing, chasing, chasing. Never stop chasing. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of anybody who ever matched the mystery, the dreamy, romantic quality of Myrna Lloyd. And when she would look at the camera, she had a strength that nobody else could match. And here we are, Gary Cooper and Barbara Stanwyck. And they're looking at each other as if uh, they're going to die as soon as they pull their arms away from each other. And that's pretty much the way they felt at that moment, too, I can tell you. In the summer, it gets pretty hot out there, so I sometimes print at night. George made a production out of everything he shot. He's got a system down. It, it works since the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, which is a long, long time. When I'm in there alone, and I don't have anything on my mind, nothing but that print. Twenty-five. Wow. Everything that you do is uh, trying to make it more perfect. Truth of the matter is, you hardly ever get it so perfect that you're completely satisfied. But you get it to a point where you like it. So leave it. He had a certain way of capturing Hollywood glamour that I think that a lot of the other photographers didn't quite achieve. They went after it, but George really got it. I think there's an intensity in these pictures. Harrell managed to achieve a certain sparkle with these lights by using these lights in a very, very intense way. He, in a lot of cases, had given the people shades while he, while he put in the main lighting and then the, there was a lot of the, their eyes started being closed, and then he, when he was ready to shoot, he would have them open their eyes as big as possible because, uh, of course, you were facing a, whatever it was, a 5K or a 10K light or even more, uh, which is, is really quite fierce. It's almost like looking in at the sun. If you look at the Marlene Dietrich, you'll notice one thing in her eyes. She has a microscopic light in that eye. It's a burning image. He knew exactly, completely, what he was doing. We should always remember, respect, be inspired by 
someone like George Harrell. I, I, I love looking at these things and, and uh, sneaking a few things out of those things, but I'm always going to try and add something different to it. I love photographing beautiful women. At the same time, I love doing personalities. I love any kind of photography. And I think that photographers are always searching and always looking and always sampling. There's much to be sampled from Harrell. I don't think that the lighting is the same. It's totally different. I use a lot of electronic flash and a lot of daylight. I use a smaller format. You can keep the energy flowing because it's one after the other. You'd have to call Harrell the king of glamour photography. I mean, he defined what it is. I mean, my style is a kaleidoscopic vision, and I do lots of different things with lots of different people with many different influences. I mean, I'm constantly shifting and changing the patterns, and everything that interests me ends up in a picture. So the picture of Sybil, who at that time to me was like a, a modern uh, Carol Lombard, was drawing on my knowledge of that period and trying to make it happen. What's amazing about his work is it far exceeds the demands of the commercial world and enters into a realm of its own, which is extraordinary, which everybody feels when they look at one of his pictures. I think about 10 years ago, I was doing a modeling job and uh, George and I did a shooting for French Vogue that was just great. I was laying in a big, luxurious bed in a white satin negligee with a tea service. And he came over and he moved my chin like this and he adjusted the light and, and he came back over and he looked at me and he took my finger and he moved my finger down a little like that. And then we shot. It was amazing. You can go in almost any direction in the fashion world. You have more freedom. You can do almost anything. You think up anything as long as you don't let yourself run too wild. You can make your models jump, fall flat on their stomachs, on their backs. You can make them stand up. You can make them very graceful. You can have them walking toward you. You don't have to worry about what they like and what they don't like. It's confined entirely to what you like. <laughs> I was so nervous with working with somebody at his stature that I was afraid that he was going to be a little, you know, a little tense with me. And, but he made me feel at ease. Good. Just a little higher, just a tight there. That's great, 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 great. And he knows when he has it. He doesn't waste any time. He sees it, he likes it, and he shoots it. It's, it's good to be out like that. It gives your figure a nice flowing line. That's great. With the sun coming down harsh, when you begin to cut down on that and shadow it, let it fall and just use it like a spotlight, do that. do that. that's when you get your really unusual effects. You feel so elegant when you're working with him that you almost feel like this is my house and this is these are my clothes and I'm living this lifestyle. There, great, great, great. She has a natural feeling for expression that is so loose and fluid. She reflects everything as if she had never been in front of a camera before. That's good, just that way. We always romanticize the past, but he too has said that there was an electricity in the air at that time, I guess the 30s, the 40s, that he doesn't feel today. 
There's been such a vast change in Hollywood. Even the weather has changed. It used to be so balmy and warm and clear skies, and now we have smog and crowded uh, highways. We didn't have crowded highways back in 1930s. Where I live, that whole valley was just agriculture. And there was big open spaces. There was no houses, big empty lots. You can almost see from here to the beach. And the people themselves were laid back. The studio took care of everything. If you got in trouble, they took care of it. Nobody got fired. Nobody got fired. And it was a great way to live. But when it started to develop, God, it just grew like mad. Still growing. They're still building like they uh, are going to run out of lumber if they don't keep it up, you know? <laughs> it's a different world today, and somehow it's not quite as pleasant to an old character like myself. And the fact that everybody was so pretty and uh, made so gorgeous and that they were so gorgeous, why, uh, it was kind of a pleasant thing. Maybe it was too artificial, like a Cinderella story. But anywho, it's a great life. So amazing to listen to George ramble on about the stories and the experiences he had. And I'm so interested in them because it was so many years before my career started. But as I began to settle into my own style and the kind of pictures that I take today, it was George's work that influenced me the most. We're going to change the light and put a grid on for a couple of I don't use as much hard lights as George does. I use a lot of spot grid lighting. I think that looks great. Greg is a very exuberant and vigorous personality. And that's a requirement with a photographer. It's a totally different ball game. I wish I could shoot this fast, but have the quality of those big negatives. I'll tell you, that's what it's all about. I don't have that particularly myself. I can uh, kind of turn on a certain amount of it. That's nice, George, at that angle. It gives you a little more shadow. That's good. That's pretty good. Greg just has that personal charm. I had no idea I was going to be so lucky when I wanted to take your picture to get to be in a piece of film about you. That's pretty good. George Harrell died on May the 17th, 1992, just two weeks shy of his 88th birthday. Oh, we're going to miss you, George, terribly. But we'll try not to feel too sad because we know that you are in wonderful company. Here we are, right on top of the world. Well, 
pretty good. We got some pretty good stuff.